welcome to today's Startup Equity Matters, the podcast, as you know, about making equity simpler and helping us get real value from startup equity. We don't want to work on these great companies and be stuck with lawyers and accountants and jargon and end up with no equity in the companies that we're building. So, you know, I'm, so, I'm excited today to be able to bring you, finally, my co-founder at Cake, uh, Kim Hansen. Hey, Kim. Hey. Uh, obviously, Kim and I have been on a, a great journey together. I think we've been working together for about eight years. Um, we're scrapping around uh, the Gold Coast ecosystem um, early on. And, you know, we thankfully, um, I guess, worked out how well we would be able to work together. And it's been it's been an awesome journey. Kim's very passionate about innovation and entrepreneurship and obviously particularly equity and how we can make it better. Specifically today, we're going to talk about a report that Cake has just released. It is an Australian equity report. So sorry for those global listeners, but hopefully the concepts that we talk about, about will resonate with you because we need to make sure as founders and leaders of startups that our teams actually know what they own and what it's worth and that you can attract, engage and retain great teams with your equity. And our report has some fantastic insights on that. But first of all, I guess, let's dig into uh, the man, Kim. Um, you know, he, he's a great startup guy. He's been doing this stuff for a long time and he's super passionate, as I said. So um, Kim, welcome. Obviously, um, I could lead this conversation down a whole bunch of embarrassing <laughs> rabbit holes for you. No, I'm kidding. But um, <laughs> give, us, um, give everyone... Um, I guess let's start with the equity side of things before we, we we go back too far. What is it about startup equity that excites you and, you know, has you spending all your time on it uh, for the last five years at least? <laughs> it's a lot of pain. But yeah, first and foremost, thanks for, for having me here for sure. It's, uh, it's awesome to jam on equity with you. Um, and it's good to just take a step back and celebrate how far we've come from not knowing anything and um, but being super passionate about the startup ecosystem. And, and now we're putting out the report of what's actually happening in the whole uh, Australian ecosystem. And we're going to do a lot more of that uh, globally as we start gathering the data. So, um, yeah, if I take a step back for, from what's really uh, been driving uh, my own passion to to deal with this difficult thing. It's just a lot of pain and confusion and exclusivity. And I remember one of my first jobs, I worked for the big banks in Portugal. And one day the CEO came in and said, hey Kim, there's something super, super exciting. We're gonna give ownership now to the partners. And I was like, wow, that sounds super important. And that sounds super exciting, but I'm not part of it. <laughs> so it also felt super excluded <laughs> and it just left me with a really bad taste and I had no clue what it was, but it sounded really important and cool, but I was not part of it. Okay, great. Way so, less cool. Way less cool. <laughs> <laughs> so my second story, so I went, and then I left that company after some time. Surprise. <laughs> oh, you left the bank? Oh, why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Did some more cool stuff with some cool companies. Um, and then when I got the chance and there was like, hey, I want to be a partner. And I want to have some equity. I had no clue what it was, but it, it sounded like it was important and something that I should be part of. And then I got these long contracts that I had to read and try and understand. I had no clue what it what it meant. And I try and talk with lawyers, but I didn't know how to ask the right questions or anything. Um, but um, yeah, at least I got some ownership. And then after a couple of years and we started actually building a really good business, we started incubating startups. It was all super exciting and we could start saying, hey, there's value in this. Okay, what about all the others? The first people I hired that actually built this. Uh, that are grinding it out every single day. Why are they not invited to, to this kind of ownership? But I still don't know what it means, but it, it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's some sort of value. And then I was trying for a couple of years, for two years, to convince the CFO and the CEO. Uh, I was a partner in CTO, but it was those. It was in the hands of those guys to try and figure this out. And it was just too difficult, too painful, uh, just impossible. And I was just like, this sucks uh, beyond. Um, so a lot of, I think, foundation of the pain was was put uh, already for me. And then also just this, well, you know, the team is sitting here every single day grinding it out and building awesome stuff. You know, mm -hmm. these, are the, these are the real heroes. We need to focus on these guys and, and just improve this stuff. Um, so a lot of pain, fusion, exclusivity was kind of my introduction to, to equity. And hopefully it's come far, but there's a lot more work to be done. 
on that part. Yeah, we have come far. And that was a UK based company in, in England, wasn't it? And in, and you're operating in Portugal, Portugal. So it was international equity. And I'm pretty sure you had some people in the US at the time. And yeah. for any of you out there that have handled international equity for teams, it's just like super hard. Although quick shout out to Cake. We've made a ton of progress in this area. <laughs> Do check it out. Although this is not an ad for Cake, but we have been working on this for some time. So it's worthwhile having a look. Um, yeah, well, when we first met and the reason, you know, just to jam on that a little bit, you know, I, you know, come from a finance background, I came into the technology industry and I was helping companies to raise capital. And like every single time I saw a contract, it was a different contract. And you go to the lawyers and they just bamboozle you with all the jargon. And even with 15 or 20 years of finance experience, I found it really challenging to understand these contracts in, in any real meaningful way. And year after year after year, I still learn, oh, that clause actually means that. Oh, great. Now I finally <laughs> realized, but I signed the contract like three, four years ago. So whoops, you know, so we need to it's help. easy to screw up <laughs> along the way and you figure out down the line, hmm, it would have been good to have known that thing at the time. And you're trying to invent with this equity and you're throwing it in all directions and like, hey, that's probably not a good idea later. Totally. <laughs> totally. So, you know, a lot of founders would just be like, oh, equity is too hard, you know, Um yeah. Thankfully now through companies like Cake and leaders like us, and there's lots of us around the world. So we're by no means, you know, taking responsibility or, you know, for everything uh, or the credit, but like, you know, there's, there's been a real movement over the last 10 years, you know, in this space. And we're so grateful to be part of that movement and help um, just improve education and accessibility. And, and um, we hope that every unicorn from now on, although unicorn is probably a dumb aspiration, uh, especially post 2021 ZERP craziness, but like every great company um, will have employee equity and will have people participating and, and whether it be, you know, small, medium or large financial outcomes that people are getting involved in that. And, and as you and I talk about a lot, and we'll get into this actually probably is a great, you know, thing for you to jam on a little bit is like, it's not all about the outcome. It's not all about the financial outcome that has to be part of it. And of course it's part of it with equity. It's a financial product, but it's, it's the meaning that you get from being part of the team and having skin in the game and, and those day-to-day, month-to-month relationships that you build is, is really where the magic is at. It built, you know, just that's the second type of real value that, that we see, right? Absolutely. And it's it's so difficult for a startup that, you know, they have to attract the best people because it's such a difficult thing to disrupt and to innovate and to take down an incumbent that is already in the, in the space or do something that doesn't exist, right? So you need really, really dedicated, smart people. And often those people, they can make a lot of money to work for a big corporation or a big bank or something like that. So you got to have something extra to motivate them. Uh, and of course, you have your vision and you have a culture and it's it's something that is meaningful, but certainly also that upside financially because you need to, you will typically pay them lower salaries when they can make somewhere else. Um, but giving that ownership really creates a lot more meaning and dedication. And then we can get to those final financial outcomes. And it's ultimately also the power in the people's hand to create their own success and the financial outcomes. That's a really big thing. I also think there's an, like, an indirect motivational driver um, just by fe- the feeling of having ownership and being respected like that um, along the way, which then indirectly actually generates more results and gives a, a higher salary along the way. Um, so I think it's really about driving that motivation and meaning. Uh, and of course we need to get to more liquidity along the way and facilitate that. So it's not just an exit or, or an IPO. Absolutely. Before we get into that, cause that's great stuff for, for the listeners, we're going to cover, you know, what it is and why, and how to, how to get the most out of it. And we're definitely going to dig into the data. We did a, a great, survey uh, we surveyed our customers and the whole community to try and work out what's working and what's not and how as leaders we can help improve um you know equity as a real driver of value for your startup but let's let's keep back because you've done some cool stuff um tell everyone about the impossible journey you know uh it was a really cool company when we first met i couldn't believe that someone would you know not to blow <laughs> to your horn too much but you know with your background you know was down here in australia on the gold coast um you know you were doing some amazing stuff there right uh you, you built an incredible company working with some of the best you know tech companies in the world out, out, out of lisbon so tell us tell everyone a bit about that it's a cool story yeah absolutely thanks for that um i've worked a lot with the banks there and i was forced to sit in a chair um and 
Um, but that didn't feel like being the most uh, effective uh, way to work. So I was starting to, and I'd done some remote work and could see I could make money when I was traveling and stuff like that. But still, it was cooler to be with other people. So I was lucky to come in to uh, inform Impossible with a, with a few other guys. And um, they had some really good network. So we could work with Google and Samsung and Roche. So we're building really cool stuff and taking all that technology uh, experience that I had from building the banks where the technology needs to be right because you can't get those transactions wrong and then putting it into really good user experience and product. Um, but I still felt we were quite detached from the actual customer. So we're doing a lot of smoke and mirrors and bloatware on the central. <laughs> <laughs> you taught and, me um, you taught me a lot about how effective consultants are over the first few years of, of working together. <laughs> so it, it was awesome for that learning journey and just learning the value of UX, but still I wanted to get a lot closer to to the customers and and we had we built more and more freedom in Impossible as well. So I could see that actually, you know, it's a bit that positivity advantage. If you're really happy and healthy, you're going to produce bigger, better results and all of that. So we can remove the the time constraints that you have to sit in a chair for eight hours to be to be really effective. So the creative healthy lifestyle, this concept I have around kind of company culture and work performance was was starting to be kind of thought about at those those times, um, and that was super exciting. Yeah, I can talk for hours about that, but um, I think we should I think we should touch on that a bit. You know, creative healthy lifestyle is part of the cake culture and ethos we talk about it at the end of every startup equity matters episode so for those of you regular listeners this is kind of where it came from and it's been critical for cake success and our brand and having a happy healthy and committed team and and i'm a total advocate um you know obviously i had inclinations down this path anyway when we met and that's part of why we get along so well but um yeah like tell us a bit about the origins of of you know, CHL, as we now call it. Um, tell us a bit about how that's that threads run through into into cake now as well. I think it's it's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's ultimately derived from the belief in the potential of human beings. I think we can do so much more than sitting in front of Netflix and eating pizzas. Um, <laughs> you know, builders to be creative people. You you once you become a dad and you see a little child of two year old that is just running off, so it's just full of energy and everything is just a learning experience, right? It's full on curiosity and creativity. And I always kind of for me, it's the core why. That's who we are as human beings. And then we put all these layers but there's so much energy and creativity found right there. Now, how can we have that in a work context? So in the in the kind of, when I worked at the consultancy agency, we we're working for all these corporates. So we're like, okay, let's travel out in nature because we were, we were in the big city and work from there and be very effective on that. Um, but ultimately I got tired of always driving out in nature. And I thought, well, the Gold Coast is a pretty awesome place to do the opposite. Let's be in nature and then travel into the cities uh, when you can and have much more of this creative, healthy lifestyle. Basically, also just um, it's incorporating a life that in includes more um, focus on health, more focus on, on nature, making sure you have really good family relationships as they're the foundation for you to function well as a person. And also, uh, as human beings, uh, if we suffer inside, it's really difficult to make uh, creative uh, good stuff um, and think about uh, be empathetic and, and really care for nature and all of that. So if we are close to nature, if we are close to and have good family relationships, all our products and everything that all our decisions will take that into account. Uh, so I believe we, we create a better world with that. So we do a lot of that uh, at Cake. We celebrate everyone's journey. And this is not about you know going to a fitness center every day or anything like that. Each person is on their own journey. We call it kind of, we like the Japanese concepts around Ikigai. Uh, you know, what is the individual's Ikigai and journey? So it can be reading a book, going for a walk, go out surfing, whatever it is, but we help and support each other on, on that journey. And it, and it is important that health is a, is, is something that is a priority for, for everyone. Um, but it's, I think, a, yeah. I absolutely love it. And for those of you that know Cake and the Cake community, I'm sure you've experienced this vibe permeating through us like almost constantly, but, you know, through more overtly through our yoga and surf events and, and whatnot. But um, like, I, it, it's, it's just a fantastic um, way to be and more and more people are, are on the bandwagon in their own way and, and that's cool um, I guess one last thing on the, on the old school stories uh, just to get to know you a bit um, you've incubated a bunch of startups out of Impossible you know the beginning of your startup journey um, I know Bond Touch is, is, is a cool one I hope you don't mind me naming that um, you know just tell us a little bit about how you got into the, the startup space like early days um, 
it's it's interesting to hear how people get on that journey <laughs> no absolutely um i think it was the just it it was the con constant learning about what can technology do well it accelerates things okay great if you're building products and using product thinking great you can you can create better experiences you can take that technology that's often hidden and then uh, create a lot of value for that but throughout the consultancy work, we were not close enough to, to the customer. So I, I was really seeing that, well, you know, there was Silicon Valley. We were lucky to work a lot from there. So I saw the design thinking and how you create empathy and how you get really, it's all about, you know, before you throw a lot of technology at stuff, you're really trying to validate, is there a problem here? What's the context of the person really shifting that perspective and then uh, constantly validating that. And then you slowly introduce technology to, to accelerate it. Um, so I think that that created the foundation for startups. Um, and then at uh, Impossible, as we were doing quite good with the consultants where we started having all these skills to think about the, the user experience, we, we thought it would be awesome to try and change the world for the better and, and start incubating startups. And, and we did multiple internal uh, products and projects and a lot of them fa failed and crashed and some were kind of linear growth. So it never really uh, happens. Um, and then we had one uh, bond touch um, that actually went kind of explosive. Uh, it hit, the timing was right. It was a great product. We iterated fast. It was really tricky because it was hardware and software. Uh, we had learned some hardware from experience with a great company uh, called uh, the Fairphone, which was its own startup, but we were very close to their journey and seeing how they built hardware. So we could take a lot of those learnings. Um, Later on, the, when we had this big success with Bond Touch, a lot of greed came in. The contracts around the equity uh, kind of became really, really, really important. And the partners kind of started having a, an, a, a, a big battle. <laughs> um, and it took, it took many, many years to resolve that. And I saw how much, you know, um, if you don't get the contracts right, it can just, it can ruin families and lives and like it's, it's, and it costs so much money and also felt the pain from typically what lawyers will do is that they will fortify you. They'll put walls around you and they're going to put up guns and then, you know, then it'll take your money forever. Uh, <laughs> well, there's no solution there. It's just like an ongoing thing until someone gives up out of pain or, or money. We're running uh, out of money. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> gnarly watching the lawyers, like good quality lawyers with deep pockets on all sides. It's like crazy what goes on. So I think we have we, we have an opportunity to, to make sure less startups end up in this situation, that it's more clear what the different ways are. So it's ultimately when there's not clarity in things or you're not following the best practices or standards, that you end up in these gridlock situations that just ruin everybody except the pockets of, of yeah. lawyers. Incredible learning there. And of course, bad outcomes can always happen. Um, every We are humans. We have weaknesses. Um, everybody goes on their own journey. And when lots of money is involved, um, people can get really confused and weird. And, and, and then lawyers are like actually experts at making it worse. Sorry, lawyers, we love you in some ways, but holy shit, you can be tough at times. <laughs> Um, um, but, but you can mitigate the risk and, and the key lesson here is it's, a, it's at day one, unfortunately, when you have to mitigate these risks and it's hard, but you can't go back and unravel a lot of these things when it comes to legal contracts and compliance and regulatory rules and tax. So not to scare you and we want it to be simple and fast, but, um, you do need to try and get these things as right as possible in the beginning. And that's, that's, that's a good pivot into cake because, you know, our mission, whole mission for the last five, six years has been in this area. How do we help simplify and streamline equity so founders can move fast and not end up with big problems down the track? Because we don't want to see day one founders that have killed themselves to get 500 grand in the bank from angels go and then spend 20 grand on legals, uh, but we don't want to see them make huge mistakes. Um, we want to see them build great teams and, and use equity for their teams. But, you know, again, we don't want them bogged down for six months going backwards and forwards between their accountant and their lawyer just to get something simple set up. So um, let's go into cake. Let's talk about some of the innovations. Um, let's talk about the journey. Let's talk about some of the wins that we've had. Maybe we can start with like the one-click ESOP. I think one of the coolest things we've done, we call it an ESOP. It can be called other things. But, you know, employee share option plan, we have one at Cake that you can hit one button and, you know, largely the whole thing appears. It's pretty amazing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey, um, you know, in, in building that and how it all, you know, some of the some of the war wounds we have. 
Absolutely. I guess sometimes it's good to be naive uh, around uh, a technical subject that you're trying to um, to solve because else you would give up if you do too much about it. But And I think that's definitely been from my perspective a little bit uh, in the beginning and on. But also just, you know, we create the world we want to see, right? So uh, like further down along the line, our vision is to really make equity invisible. So you only get the ultimate power of it as a motivation driver. Uh, on the team and then create liquidity. So, uh, but that's a step stepwise journey to get there. We understand that the contracts needs to be there. Um, but we saw also, for example, when you go and book an Airbnb, uh, there's a contract signed, but you never touch that contract. You never have to read it. So it's kind of like invisible in the background. So these type of uh, kind of solutions were inspiring us. We we saw on Amazon, you know, in the beginning when you had to buy online, you had to fill out all these forms and it was just so complex and so, so painful, right? And then they invented kind of a one-click um, checkout uh, button and from functionality. So here we can see how you can just really make a lot of these things invisible. So you just get the value uh, from, from the product. Um, so that's our vision. And, and because of that, we started kind of thinking about, well, how can you set up an ESOP just with one click? Um, how can we build the contract? So they're actually integrated into the cap table. Um, so we built a contract engine behind the scenes. It was super hacky in the beginning. It was using Google Docs and an API, which was not built for that at all. So every time I, I might tried it myself, I was scared it was going to break. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it worked well enough to see there was a demand and that people really want this. And that way of thinking that, well, equity needs to transact hands, that's where it, the power of it. It's not just a static cap table. So building the flow in, building the contracts in, building the signing, all these things that do need to happen um, building them into a, together with the ownership is really where the power is. Um, so we built these one-click concepts. We still have very far to go, but it's at least an incredible, delightful experience now, especially compared to some other platforms out there. Uh, <laughs> we've come far. Yeah, we have. And, you know, just thinking through the journey and, and the vision, you know, it was always our vision to, you know, create global borderless equity. And that was born from the crypto space. And I don't want to like connect us too closely, you know, because it's a bit scary. But what we loved about it was, you know, it was totally global and it was super, super fast. And you can have capital like anywhere it needed to be at any time. And, and the consumer, the investor consumer, whoever, the supporter was was totally free to do that as they please. And look, it has a whole raft of issues that we're not, not going to go into, but the speed and, and the, the borderlessness and and the openness was really exciting. And, and that's where we think equity can be in time. Of course, we need to bring the regulations along. So, you know, we've got the, the management layer of all the compliance, and then we've got the execution layer of the transactions, which is the legal agreements and the buying and selling and all the emotion when it comes to capital raising. And, yeah. and then once you build those, then, then of course you can have, you know, those, those higher order outcomes of borderlessness and speed and accessibility. So anyway, I hope, hope I explained that okay, but that, that was a bit of the journey, eh? Yeah, and two points on that. I think, you know, just seeing that it's possible to do cross-border things with technology, but you gotta do the real contract, the real work, uh, work, uh, work that is for each region. That's really important to solve that, but there's a desire for ownership everywhere and people want to have more liquidity. So that's kind of a strong validation point uh, of how the world is doing. We also want to see a much more diverse and inclusive world. So if we are super, super passionate about in, at, at Cake to bring more equity ownership to all corners of the world. There's 8 billion people on this planet full of energy and creativity and, and curiosity. And who knows better what's, what's good in a local society than the people that live there. So, you know, if we can give them ownership, if we can create liquidity there, they're going to feed that into their ecosystems. And I absolutely love, I'm so in love with the ripple effect when you see pe people that get employees, that get ownership, and then they they eventually are liquidate that. And then they go and give, um, they take some of that and they often reinvest it into other startups. And they've already have really good experience. So they're pretty good at judging which startups are, are good or bad. And they give mentorship, advice, and a lot of them also go and build startups themselves. So this incredible flywheel effect that we've seen also in Australia, now with, with Canva is gonna you know, do a 1.5 billion secondaries. So basically do a big payday to a lot of employees and early investors. A lot of these will do this ripple effect. So it's an amazing thing for, for Australia, I believe in the upcoming months, it's gonna be very, very exciting to, to follow all of this. 
we had Kristen Yokulu um, on the panel uh, a few weeks back in Melbourne to show a perfect example of someone who, who was fortunate to get ownership in Canva and Atlassian, exited some of that. He invested into Cake and multiple other startups. He's been advising Cake and taking a lot of that experiences he had in Canva, which was so helpful for us. Um, and now he's gone and built his own startup. Like what a beautiful story. Imagine we we scale this to a thousand, to a hundred thousand, to a million people, right? That's just going to accelerate everything. And when and you do globally, that, global, and globally as well, you can have Australian equity in Africa and and in Asia. And I mean, I saw one of our customers has got their equity up in Nepal. You know, companies all over the world can be sharing their equity all over the world. It's still hard. It's getting much easier, especially with platforms like Cake. But it's going to get easier and easier. Its impact like globally, societally, uh, economically, it's tremendous. Equity is becoming much more of a, a real currency to create wealth and, and distribute wealth much, much better. So amazing. It's such a cool, such a cool journey. And to go to the report, we can see, you know, it's already have matured. The, the equity understanding has matured a lot in Australia. Now 61% of employees see equity as an important part of accepting a role. Which is just incredible progress. Yeah, and still a lot of when work we started, well, we don't have reports from when we started, but it had to be less than ten percent. Exactly. Like every single ESOP we saw was broken. Everyone, like I've got an ESOP, and they send it to you, and they've got like the plan rules, no resolution signed, no offer letters <laughs> sent, or like even if they did have the offer letters sent, there's no way their team but would have any paper idea. in a drawer somewhere that nobody understands, right? At least now we can see, we can track yeah. the value of it. It's still only half of the people that actually understand the value of it, and we have to really help both founders and employees understand the value of it, or communicate it well around it, celebrate the successes along the way uh, together as a team. We're creating this ownership. We're we are being able to to define our our destiny and and success uh, a lot uh, through that, and so that's super powerful and exciting. Well, let's pull out some of the top stats, Kim. Have you got them there? I've got them here. Um, let's run through some of the the key findings. Obviously, we won't dig into it too much, and it is our first big report, so it's not like thousand pages like the cool uh, cut through ventures do the other day. But um, I think it's still a, a massive step forward. And I'm so excited for the Australian ecosystem that there's more and more data available because we need it to make decisions and, and build the, the build a community. So glad to be part of the part of the solution. Uh, what what were the headline numbers, man? Let's run through them. Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, 61 see it as very important in that acquisition process as part of the negotiations, which basically tells us if you're a startup now, you do need to have, uh, you need to be able to offer equity ownership uh, because people will expect this. And this is going to grow a lot. 54.6% um, of uh, employees are highly motivated uh, from it already, coming from very, very little. Again, there's room to grow, uh, but the power of that is just incredible because you can, you know, keep keep them, retain them in your company, even though you might pay them half the salary that they can make in a they can make in a corporate. So, um, and how does Cake help with that? How does Cake, you know, like as normally I wouldn't promote Cake too much, but I do have uh, two Cake founders on here. How how does Cake currently help? Because we're working into that space constantly at Cake, right? It can't just be a record keeping platform. So boring. How do we help motivate, engage, and retain people uh, at Cake? What what are we doing? What experiments are we running? Yeah, I think it's really visualizing what equity is in much better ways. Uh, so you know, it's it's more about people and that motivation and saying, here, me as a founder, I'm going to give you ownership in this awesome thing that we're building. And this is the, you know, the mission we have together, you know, when, when you include it in the culture and saying, hey, what's what's your dreams? I want to buy a house or something like that. Great. Those are the financial outcomes. How do we track the value of it? So we're constantly iterating on, a, on an employee app where you can see every month how much you're owning. You know, you have another vesting happening. So your ownership is growing. What does your portfolio look like? What could it potentially become? And then more than that, you know, those kind of celebrations together, that emotional feeling around that typically happens uh, around the team and especially through founders and employees to say, hey, I'm giving you this ownership. Then you can easily communicate that forth and back. Uh, between the employees and the founders through the app. So you're attaching the emotion to that kind of dry number uh, that it, that is not so meaningful before there is kind of liquidity happening. So it's yeah. really building a lot of those features to visualize it and, and um, understand it better. As we can see, only half understand the value of the equity. So now we have a lot of 
little hints and easy breakdowns of what the different terms mean. So you can at any time just read those through the app. Um, That's so an important part. Like what's vesting? What's exercising? How do I do that? Like, uh, do I have a tax problem? Like they have so many questions and and a lot of that information is now in the, in the app. They can see it right there next to their holding. So taking the responsibility off the company because it's hard to do this communication all the time and plus they might not even know and putting it right there in the hands of the team member so they can be like, oh, okay, I get it now. Uh, I don't have a tax bill because I've got a cool ESOP and the company's taken the, you know, the time to settle out well for me and communicate with me. Okay, maybe I will work hard to increase its value, um, those yeah. sorts of things. And and even more now, we have built a database of many uh, stakeholders, more than 150,000 on, on Cake, and we track all the transactions and we have a good insights to how well the companies are doing, how they're using the equity to grow. So really taking all that data, uh, which we're giving out in reports to help the ecosystem, but we're also using it to guide uh, startup founders so they don't have to make these complicated decisions uh, and to understand how much do I need to give an engineer you know, we're just providing a perfect little guideline. It's normally inside. This is the best practice for you to to, to use this. So you have a little slider, and you can just say say go. So this is a huge progress from just well here. Put in an input field. How much are you going to give? Right, like <laughs> you have no clue, or you have to go and read all these uh, these long blocks to try and understand, uh, figure out for your startup. So we're just using this data to make it more and more intelligent so that uh, we can help you make those decisions and just stay within the best practices and standards. So you can just focus on the cool stuff uh, of building great products uh, and together. Nice, nice. What other couple of stats you got for us, mate? Help people uh, unpack this report. Yeah, I think uh, I finally just, you know, after, after COVID, I think we've seen a shift in how the people are thinking uh, with remote work. So there was a bit of forced remote work, but then people are seeing the advantages with that as well. As well and then they desire that more. They want to have more ownership uh, as well as they're seeing the power of this. They, we've seen, uh, now we're talking specifically in Australia, we've seen the successes with Canva and Atlassian. You know, a lot of people are talking about this. So there's a bit of, you know, power to the people ground up happening. Uh, people are searching for more purpose. They're searching for lifestyle. COVID was a was a hard slap to a lot of people in the face, you know, and it's not so cool just to sit at home and, and order and buy a lot of stuff. You actually want to have, you know, a more healthy lifestyle. You want to have purpose in the things that you're doing. So there's a search for more meaning in, in, in our lives. And I think startups is probably one of the most meaningful things you can possibly do where you it's tough, but you step up to the challenge and become the best version of yourself. Um, so we've seen uh, incredible growth um, in the usage of uh, of equity in the last couple of years, especially accelerated after after COVID. One of the let's do one more stat. I've got one here. Thirty four percent of founders think they communicate the value of their equity effectively. I think it's a cool stat because look, it's not a bad result because it's very hard to communicate about. I would hazard to guess that it would have been a lot lower a few years ago. Um, you know before you know, things have improved a ton and I think we've helped with that. But, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there for founders to to learn how to improve more effectively. Let's talk a little bit about that. So for me personally, I often advocate for having a slide in your all hands. You know, people do an all hands, um, I think maybe monthly plus or minus. Talk about the value of your equity every month uh, with your team in the all hands. It doesn't have to be, hey, like the equity is worth X this month, every month. I think that's probably a bit too hectic, but it could be, um, you know, there's a raise coming up or our raise has gone successfully. It could be, you know, we've hit some great new milestones. This helps in the value of your equity. It could be helping people understand how they can be, you know, rowing together in the right direction to increase the value of their equity. It could be that there's a secondary coming up or even that the leadership think, hey, 2024 could be a year for a secondary and, and we're at least working on it. So bring it to life. If you're thinking about it, let them know, obviously in the right way and don't overhype it, probably the biggest risk and all you good founders out there will know this for sure. And I don't mean to hassle anybody, but you don't want to be like, hey, like we're worth 100 million and we're going to have an exit for a billion next year or any of that crap. Of course, I'm stretching that to the nth degree, but keep it real. Keep it fair. If you're not sure, ask. Ask Cake. Ask Cake's, you know, customer success people. Even ask Kim or I. We love sharing our insights. Um, you know, perhaps ask other great leaders. There's heaps of great accelerators. There's, there's tons of great startup minds in Australia. Ask your advisors. Go out and, and ask how you can best communicate that. Um Kim, any, any thoughts on how founders can maybe help 
and educate um yeah educate i think well? i think you know there's it's creating that excitement for me it's also really keeping it simple right um at cake we use okrs um and you know there's various successes out there but i think we're doing quite well in that the more you can tie the, the results, the success of your OKR hitting your targets with the value of, of your company. And then you can tie each person with their individual KPIs up to the OKRs. You can see how each person can directly influence the value of their own equity. And I think that's super exciting. I think we're already seeing that we've come really far uh, with that at Cake. And I'm hoping that we can really take a lot of that kind of formulas and build it into the Cake products and startups out there can have a more simple way of defining what's the value of equity and protecting it a bit. So it's, uh, you know, we see a lot in the media of all sorts of valuations depending on the market fluctuations, right? But ultimately, you want to build real value in your company and see how each person can contribute to that and then keep it really simple. Um, so I'm very excited about what we're doing and how we can share that with with our customers nice here's a left field one as well maybe ask your team interview them and then get their answers whether it be anonymous or not we did one recently where we interviewed a bunch of our team members on what equity meant to them and how it affects them day to day and the answers that we got were really heartfelt really warming and really authentic and it changed my view of how impactful equity was and you might find that to be a really like deep and authentic way to connect your team members together. Anyway, a little bit out there, but I think kind of kind of cool. Um, all right, so we've talked about like yourself, Cake, and and the report. Let's finish with the report. There were some recommendations. Uh, I guess we've given our own recommendations to a degree along the way. I mean, was there one or two of the recommendations at the end of the report that you might want to touch on? Obviously, you can get the report where, Kim? Like from our website or we'll, we'll put it in the link underneath, but it's on our website somewhere, surely? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's just all about experimenting how you communicate in simple terms uh, to motivate and drive your team. Try and take that value that you're vesting every month and make it something real, you know? Celebrate it with a bottle of wine or whenever a new new person becomes an owner, uh, when someone is hitting a big milestone. Experiment with the milestones and, you know, tie the goals of the whole company directly to, to the ownership um, so we can all just drive for, for meaning. Yeah, as you said, it was heartfelt to see uh, when we asked our, our um, own team how they relate their ownership with their own values and the culture that we have at Cake. So I think it's really communicating a lot more around it and celebrate your wins. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves with that. We always just go, go, go. Make sure you celebrate the wins and tie them into the, to the value of your equity. Amazing. So look, Kim, I could talk to you all day. Of course, we love this stuff. Um, we better wrap it. And also, I know you got to go soon. We've already done the CH Hell segment. What I thought we could do is do a little plug for the Gold Coast where we're based. I know we're a global company and I love being a global company and I love helping founders and teams everywhere, but we live in a special place and you chose the Gold Coast over lots of other cities. And I'm sure our community here on the Goldie would love if we could give a little plug. So what was it about the Goldie? Like, tell us a bit about the process you used, you know, why you chose the Gold Coast and a bit about why it's awesome and how we're going to, you know, how it can be a great home for other like founders and creatives and entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a well-kept secret. <laughs> it's obviously an incredible weather we have here. And, and I think for me personally, at least having access to nature right out your door is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I used to think that, you know, places like these are quite limited because there is not so much knowledge work or technology and, and a lot of uh, really smart people typically gravitate towards the cities where they can really make a lot of money. But, you know, we've uh, technology has facilitated so much um, cross-border um, communication and, and work uh, culture. So, you know, and we can actually have access to technology here. So it's a, I think the Gold Coast is a perfect base to have a little headquarters and build a global startup and leverage technology. A lot of times it can be optimized to communication uh, when you have limited uh, time to overlap. So you can really be in your creative focus uh, space uh, instead of running around in a, in a noisy office. So, you know, there's challenges with that. Um, I think we're doing really, really well. Um, and I think I, I wanna see a lot more uh, small startups here that maybe have the headquarters here and then, then they can still grow globally um, with remote teams. Love it, thanks for sharing. Look, just because I wanted to make this a little Gold Coast ad, I'm going to add, you know, like great culture, great lifestyle, 
five minutes to the beach, uh, five minutes to the hinterland, you know, <laughs> surfing, mountain biking, and and more and more and more great people that are innovative, as you say, uh, the pandemic and, and technology and remote work has allowed people to move anywhere. So we welcome more great people here. If you do happen to move here or, or you know someone, please do connect us in. Um, you know, we'd love to see the space grow and grow and grow. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so Kim, look, thanks. Um, I, I think we've, you know, we've shared some quality insights and um, got to know you a little bit better. And look, uh, it's great building cake with you. I'm stoked you could join the pod. And uh, yeah, onwards and upwards for startup teams, eh? Thanks so much, Tess. Awesome to jam with you. Let's do it once in a while. Totally. Cool. See ya. Bye.